selfies. I could look at selfies all day. And in fact, that's kind of what I've been doing for the past 20 years. And no, I'm not interested in reliving my youth via Snapchat, but I would like to introduce you to the grandmother of all selfies, Earth. So over half a decade ago, we thought that it was about time that Earth posed in all her wonder and glory for us to see. And so in 1964, far cooler than a selfie stick, we launched Nimbus, tasked to create Earth's selfie album. And ever since, we've been checking out her wonderful oceans and sea ice, forests, ozone layer, snow-capped mountains, beautiful sparkling city lights. Sometimes she covers her wares in clouds, and other times she bears all, and we see her beauty and treasures. On a not-so-good day, we see her pouty anger about to storm with tears, where she can't quite reach with moisturiser, and her scars from third-degree burns, or where we've created incisions for various operations. If you've ever spent just a moment on Google Earth, you've stepped into my world as a remote sensing scientist. I have the privilege of viewing these amazing Earth selfies and using them to create maps of the environment, helping us understand what's there, how it changes over time, and ultimately, how we can manage our environment. Using this sort of technology, we're able to ask the sorts of questions like, how big is the Great Barrier Reef? Well, it's about the size of Italy, or half the size of Texas. How many individual reefs do we have? Nearly 3,000. How much live coral is out there? Well, we can't actually answer that one just yet. One of the reasons that we can't is because these satellites are several hundred kilometers away. And so what we actually see when we zoom all the way in is pixels. Now, I spent some time as an engineer in the Australian Army where I was introduced to drones. And I thought, hey, what if I could get one of these for myself and I could put a camera on a drone and I could see if I could find the live coral. So this is one of my first drones with a camera strapped to it with none other than a brass strap. <laughs> I have some more sophisticated setups now. So I want you just to imagine that these are your cameras. This is a couple of hundred thousand dollars worth of camera attached to a drone. And so you're getting ready for takeoff. The motors start up and it sounds like a scourge of mosquitoes. So you're kind of nervous. You've got all this money getting ready to fly. But then all of a sudden, you see what an eye on the ground cannot. Perspective. I marvel that through science and technology, I'm able to now see, even in a single shot, sharks, turtles, rays, even individual sea cucumbers, I can count them, and I know that there's thousands out there churning over the sediment on the reef on a daily basis. And finally, I can see my live coral, and we can actually start to map how much live coral we have on the Great Barrier Reef through this technology. So if I take a step back from the sort of work with, that I do with drones, I love mapping. But there's so many different applications for drones out there. And when I ask a number of my friends and colleagues why they fly drones, they tell me a bunch of different reasons. So I think this is a really cool technology that pretty much anyone 
can be a part of. And then I want to reflect on something that happened to me last year. So it was about this time last year, during National Science Week, and I was visiting a number of different schools, sharing what I do with Earth selfies and drones. And when I went to the primary schools, the kids were so excited about what I do, and they just peppered me with questions for an entire session. Boys and girls, it didn't matter. All sorts of questions. Yet when I went to the local high schools, the girls didn't show up. And so I wondered why. Do our tastes change really that quickly that from primary school we go from being curious about all sorts of things to all of a sudden in high school, girls are not interested in this technology or these amazing applications? And I was talking about it with a good friend and colleague of mine, Dr. Catherine Ball. And around about the same time, she rang me up and she goes, hey mate, you in your office? And I said, yeah, sure. And she goes, jump on your computer, radio. And she said, I want you to Google drones for girls. And this is what we saw. So unfortunately, this sends the message that yes, girls can do anything as long as they wear a bikini. And this is my industry, and it's not really the message that I want to be sending to young girls that I want to encourage into this wonderful science that I do. So we dug a little bit deeper. What we wanted to do was to replace those images that we saw on that search. So we tried to amass all the women that we knew who were drone pilots, and we found that in Australia, we have about 1% female drone pilot and for such an emerging technology, where are all the women? We have an untapped resource here. And we dug a little bit deeper and I found that Australia actually hemorrhages female talent from as early as primary school. So much so that by the time we graduate in science, technology, engineering and maths, only 16% of those graduates are women. We need to be able to source from 100% of our talent pool to make sure that we can grow our economy. Now, I've known for many years that I'm a minority in the sort of work that I do. In the first technical conference that I went to back in 2000, I was stunned, though, to see that there are only about 15% women. This is a standard conference that I attend, and this one was actually taken earlier this year, so the statistics haven't really changed that much. So again, where are the women? And for many years, I've, I've known this, but I actually haven't thought to do too much about it. But then I heard Dr. Zeus and the Lorax in my ear. Unless someone like you cares a whole awful lot, nothing is going to change. It's not. Well, I do care a whole awful lot. I'd like to see some of these statistics change. And my colleague, Dr. Catherine Ball, also cares. And so we started a program called She Flies really designed to encourage more girls and women into science through the world of drones. And so lucky for us, the state government of Queensland thought this was a pretty good idea. And so they gave us some money to go back to that high school where no girls showed up and to run a drone day. And I thought, geez, I'll be lucky if I get 20 girls. Let's see how this goes. So I offered a girls only drone day. I had 60 girls and a waiting list, which really gave me an insight into how we need to communicate some of these opportunities if we want to encourage our young girls and women into these careers. So yes, I teach girls how to fly. I teach them all the safety aspects that we need to know 
when working with this emerging technology. But importantly, I also teach the teachers because it's really important to empower the teachers so that they can continue to engage with their students as well. So we're mapped to the Australian National Curriculum and they can continue working with these students. I also work with boys. I do aim for a higher proportion of girls to try and change those statistics. So we have about 80% female participation at the moment, but I definitely work with boys too. But I'm gonna let you in on a secret. It's not about the drone. It actually has very little to do with the drone. What you see here is a group of grade six school children learning to be geospatial scientists. I want to shatter the illusion that scientists wear white lab coats. I want children and adults to be working together cooperatively. I want to encourage critical thinking, creative learning, problem solving. These students have been told that there was a cyclone in the map area that they're looking at. They need to use their drone to go and determine the impact of that cyclone. Exactly the same as what I would do if I was in the field with my drone. So they have to come up with their own flight plans, they figure out exactly how they're going to do it, and then they'll undertake the mission. I also believe that it's really important to try and encourage creativity. So in this example, these girls have created their own piece of art. And now they need to work out, using trigonometry, exactly how high to fly their drone so they'll capture the perfect photo. Not too big, not too small, one photo. They don't need to think that they're doing maths but we embed it anyway. And I'm not sure if you've ever seen drones used for entertainment, but Lady Gaga, Disney, Cirque du Soleil, they're all using drones for their entertainment. So why not encourage people to start learning early how we can do this? And these girls have coded their drone. They've done this using programming to give that display. So I really try to take examples that I know drones are used for out in the real world and just miniaturize them, bring them down for students to work on. So through some federal government funding, we've been lucky to run drone camps across northern Australia. So we've been here in Cairns, Darwin, and soon out to the Pilbara. And we also run drone days around the country. You can see a range of yellow dots there. So this is, these are the number of programs that we've run since February this year when we actually launched the program. So you can see the size of the yellow dot indicates the number of people that we've had go through the program. And on average, we're teaching three programs a week now around the country. And I say we because I can't do this by myself. And one of my happiest moments earlier this year was when I had a number of people say that they'd like to join me and they want to push this movement as well. They want to be my instructors. So I now have 11 other instructors around the, com around the country teaching what we teach with She Flies. And as much as I love what I do, why we do it, in my ideal world, She Flies wouldn't exist because it wouldn't need to. Thank you. <laughs>